Janusz Szentágatai was one of the most important neurobiologists of the 20th century. And his student, Peter Somogy, is in Oxford leading the famous anatomical neuropharmacology unit. He is the first brain prize winner, whose student is Gabor. Gabor made his PhD in neuroanatomy in Oxford and went back to Hungary after his PhD to Szeged University, where he is leading the department of neuroscience, let's put it this way. He is well known for publications in the field of neural circuits in the human brain and in the brain in general. And he will talk us about the neurocortical microcircuits with special regard to the human brain and the specificity and uniqueness of the human brain with respect to its organization and with respect to its dedicated microcircuits, Gabor. Thank you very much, Balázs, and uh, thank you very much for all of you turning up today. In the first talk, we had a really nice introduction to uh, you know, how the brain works in general. And uh, actually, I, I'm very glad that uh, you know, after Jean-Pierre's sort of top-down introduction to the topic, uh, I will be able to give you some sort of bottom-up uh, approach building blocks of the neocortex, uh, which is uh, the site uh, of our consciousness. The work I'm about to present to you started uh, 10 years ago uh, when uh, my wife asked me that, you know, Gabor, it's very nice that you are dealing with uh, interesting cell types in uh, rodent species, but uh, what about the human uh, networks? And what about, you know, us? What makes human microcircuits human? And it turns out that uh, when my wife received a prize, she's a clinician, by the way, together with a neurosurgeon, uh, you know, after treating uh, a really special uh, patient with uh, extreme uh, blood pressure, and the cause of that blood pressure was that the, that the patient's brain was, uh, you know, moved through uh, the foramen magnum, and the surgeon had to remove part of the bone, actually pressing uh, the medulla oblongata, and so the patient's uh, blood pressure dropped instantly during the surgery. So when they received that prize, they had a chat, and uh, uh, I'm fortunate to have that surgeon uh, actually within uh, our group. And uh, we started working on human tissue. Now, <clears throat> how a neuroscientist, an experimental neuroscientist, can use human tissue at all? Most of you know that some of the, uh, of the tumors uh, give rise to metastasis uh, in our bodies. Unfortunately, many of those metastases uh, end up uh, in our skull, growing inside our brain, especially in deep brain areas. Now, we ask those patients prior to their surgery whether they would donate the tissue which has to be removed in excess to those deep brain areas by the surgeon. Uh, so whether those patients would, you know, be willing to uh, sort of sacrifice the, the piece of tissue which is removed anyway from their brain uh, to uh, the purpose uh, of science. Now, I'm happy to report that 80% of those patients uh, actually agree uh, to donate that tissue. Instead of uh, you know, having the tissue incinerated, we use it uh, for studying uh, you know, the systems uh, here. Now, to give you a representation uh, where those cortical samples are coming from, this is the representation of the very first year uh, we uh, performed surgeries and experiments on surgically removed pieces uh, of human neocortex. Now, most of the tissue is actually coming from prefrontal areas and parietal areas, 
actually Jean-Pierre was referring to these areas as potential sites uh, for uh, you know, being responsible for our consciousness. Now, obviously, uh, we don't have access to primary sensory cortices or primary motor cortices because that would influence the everyday life of our patients you know, very much. However, these highly associational cortices uh, are not, uh, you know, not really needed for uh, our everyday lives, at least uh, not the way we can perceive it uh, when you know, looking at our patients before and after the surgery. So all in all, we performed more than 200 of these experiments in the last 10 years. And uh, what I'm uh, about to propose to the leaders of this university is to join a worldwide effort for studying human cortex, studying the human cortex. We actually recently teamed up with the Allen Institute of Brain Science in Seattle and they are pouring billions of dollars into this project. However, with a very narrow focus. And what I'm suggesting is that we should broaden that focus to areas uh, which are sort of uh, not so interesting uh, for the Allen uh, Brain Institute. Now, what are those areas? Those areas are the actual connections between identified human neurons. So how do we identify human neurons then? If you look at this picture, uh, it's basically an image of a 75 years old brain, human brain, of a male patient. What you see here is a microscopic image of a couple of neurons obtained by a procedure called differential interference contrast microscopy. Now this microscopy enables you to look at individual neurons without staining them. So it's an optical procedure, basically using visible and infrared light. So you are able to see pyramidal neurons in the layer two, three of the neocortex here, two of them, and an interneuron. And you realize these two pipettes placed on these cells used for electrophysiological recordings. Now, the way we record uh, these, not just duplets, but quadruplets, sextuplets, and octuplets of these cells, so meaning simultaneous eight times recordings uh, from human cortices, is that we activate some of these neurons with action potentials like this and look for the responses simultaneously occurring in simultaneously recorded cells. Now, some of these connections, like this one, are called excitatory connections because they, these actual potentials or spikes cause positive deflections relative to the baseline, activating postsynaptic neurons. Now, in the last 10 years, uh, we sort of build up a database from human cells, more than 3,000 cells we have with more than 1,000 connections. Just a reference, uh, from rodent cortices, we have uh, more than 14,000 cells and, more, and in a range of about 7,000 connections. And we are able to compare these two uh, with uh, a very good precision. Now, after recording the connections between identified human neurons, we are reconstructing the anatomy of these simultaneously recorded cells in three dimensions using light microscopic tools. And occasionally, uh, we look for the sites of connections between the cells called synapses at the electromicroscopic level. Here you see a presynaptic axon forming a synapse with a postsynaptic dendrite between some of these identified neurons. So these are the basic methodology we are using for these experiments. I promised you to tell human-specific features of uh, the neocortical microcircuit. Right from the very first experiment we performed in the human cortex, we saw something like this. When activating a single human neuron, instead of having a single response to a single spike, as documented for rodent and other uh, neocortices. So instead of that, 
what you see in the human cortex is a series of responses, not just a single response to a single spike, but a series of responses. And those responses uh, can be excitatory and also inhibitory. Excitatory responses are marked with these red dots here. And the beginning of inhibitory responses triggered by a single event in the human cortex is marked by these blue dots here. So in this case, we recorded from three pyramidal cells, the red cell, the green cell, and the blue cell. And when we activated, uh, actually, the red cell, the green cell responded with this series of events, the blue cell with a completely different series of events. Now, actually, when you look at it, and you want to build a minimal network needed for the construction of these event series, this is the sort of minimal network required. As you see, you activate a single cell here, which we call a trigger cell for trigger EPSPs, and you record from these other two cells, named two and three here, and in between these, you have an unidentified network producing these responses. So these are not so-called monosynaptic responses, you know, direct communications between identified neurons, but so-called polysynaptic responses, products of a network activated by a single neuron with a single spike and targeting downstream neurons, several synapses downstream. In case you look at the event clouds triggered by single human spikes, this is the picture which actually emerges. Initially, you have a blue cloud following the spike, then you have a red cloud and a blue cloud again, meaning that you have a sequence of inhibition, excitation, and in inhibition on this cell. On the other cell, you have blue, 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 meaning inhibition followed by inhibition followed by inhibition. So the very same spike can have, you know, several readouts depending on where you sample your network in the human cortex. Now, triggering clouds of events from one spike is one thing. However, even more interesting, possibly, is whether you have some sort of an internal structure built in to these clouds of events triggered by single spikes. When you look at uh, the correlations, the temporal correlations between, let's say, a blue dot here and a red dot here, what you see is that the timing of these pairs of events, like a blue dot here and a red dot here, moves in correlation relative to the spike, meaning that in case there is a slight delay in starting an event sequence, that that delay is maintained throughout, as if the first word of a sentence would have been started later a little bit, but the same word is still there, okay? So we have internal correlations between different events uh, in the cloud of events here. Now, <clears throat> in a more exact way, the latency of these even pairs varies in correlation relative to the uh, trigger spike here along this uh, uh, 45 uh, degrees uh, linear relative to, uh, to the spike. So basically, these events go hand in hand relative to the trigger. Uh, event. Obviously, there are some events which do not do like that. So, some events uh, do not have, I mean, some event clouds do not have internal correlations, but that's, that is to be expected. So, the point here is that uh, in response to a single human spike, you have uh, an event sequence with an internal structure. And this is a very old idea proven experimentally. Very old meaning 
more than, more than half a century old, put forward by Donald Hebb in his famous book. Actually, Donald Hebb uh, had two major contributions to neuroscience. One is that he suggested that uh, a particular way, particular way of strengthening a connection between two cells is that you have the two cells working simultaneously. That's his first postulate. However, the second Hebbian postulate, equally important in my view, is that in case you activate cell A, and if you want to have cell B in the same so-called neural assembly with cell A, that means that through cell C's and D's, you have a chain of uh, neurons uh, communicating, and that way, cell A and B would be part of the same representation. And these neural assemblies uh, are uh, basically a hot topic ever since. What we have shown is that human networks, as opposed to all other networks studied to date, can activate these networks just by a single event in a single cell. Now, intuitively, this is potentially important because, just think about it, in order to retrieve a package of information from a system, you don't need several events. You need just that one spike. And the series of events is being read out of the system. So let's compare what an animal network can do, at least proven experimentally is that you activate a single cell and the sequence of events is not longer than three milliseconds, meaning you can activate a cell downstream, but no more, just a single cell or a single sort of phase of events. On the other hand, human networks tend to be a lot more sensitive to this single cell activation. In fact, an order more sensitive than animal networks. Now, what do I mean by you know, animal networks? So in case you have a spike uh, in a cell, in a so-called hippocampal region uh, of uh, a red brain, what you can have is an activation, a direct activation of the postsynaptic neuron with a spike. However, the second cell cannot activate downstream cells further on. In the human, we do have evidence for this downstream uh, activation, producing longer and longer even sequences. In the animal sort of uh, networks, a single neuron can also be potentially important, however, if you want to see the effect of a single neuron, you have to activate the very same neuron repeatedly for a very long time, very long meaning, you know, for several tens of milliseconds. And here is a crucial example to that, which uh, the, uh, the leader of this laboratory, Michael Brecht, called reverse physiology. So what you do here, instead of stimulating the periphery and looking at the central response, you want, it, want, you want to do it the other way around. You stimulate a single cell in your brain or in the brain of an animal and look for some sort of an effect at the periphery. And this is what happens. In case you activate a single neuron in the cortex with a series of events and look for some peripheral response, there you have it. But you need to activate this cell repeatedly in a rather, I would say, unphysiological way. Now, let's return to human uh, networks. When you look at the internal structure of these human event sequences, you notice that there is a fixed delay for a particular type of response. You have the very first phase coming out of these excitatory neurons, producing this excitatory wave, monosynaptic uh, 
EPSPs excitatory postsynaptic potentials on the target neurons. Second, you have this deep canyon separating the initial excitation from this late excitation here. And simultaneous to this deep canyon of lack of excitation, you have inhibition peaking. So it seems that we have something like excitation, inhibition, excitation, and so forth. Now, let's try to explain why is that. Now, the first sort of big difference between a human excitatory synapse and the rodent excitatory synapse is the strength or the potential strength of these individual synapses. What you have in the human cortex is very, very big excitation linking excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, and weak excitation linking excitatory cells with other excitatory cells. In the rodent, you have the same sort of pattern from excitatory cells to interneurons. So the major difference between a human and the rodent is this part here. This tail of huge, very effective excitatory synapses linking pyramidal neurons, excitatory cells in our cortex, to inhibitory interneurons or GABAergic cells. Here's an example for that. So you have the red spikes in the pyramidal neuron, the excitatory neuron. You have these big subthreshold events. Just mind you, this is two millivolts, so this is about uh, 12 millivolts here. And in more than 50% of the trials, this single spike drives the postsynaptic cell across the threshold and produces action potentials in the postsynaptic neuron. So there is a spike to spike coupling. This is the link, basically, which is missing in rodent cortices because of the lack of this huge, uh, very efficient synapses. Now, one might ask, you know, after Jean-Pierre's Jean -Pierre's presentation that, all right, we have billions of synapses. How many synapses are needed for such a strong spike-to-spike -spike coupling in the human cortex? Well, the simple answer is you don't need more than one, necessarily. And that's another surprise. So in this case, we have a postsynaptic human interneuron receiving input from this pyramidal cell. In this uh, sort of figure, you only have uh, the axon, the presynaptic axon, going to form the synapse on the postsynaptic dendrite, and the rest of the presynaptic neurons anatomy is ign completely ignored. Okay, So this is just the route from the soma to the synapse here. And this very synapse is shown on this electron micrograph. Here you have the axon. Here is the uh, uh, synaptic cleft. And here is the synapse between the two cells. Now, looking at the same sort of situation at the light microscopic level, you have the presynaptic axon, the postsynaptic dendrite. And this picture is projected here uh, with the EM. Now, how about the physiology? You activate the, the red cell. This is the subthreshold response. And uh, in approximately 23% of the cases, you have the postsynaptic spike. So there is a spike to spike coupling through a single synapse. Now, what makes a human synapse so effective? This was our central question for the sort of last four years. Just to give you an idea uh, how easy to answer these sorts of questions in the human, we don't have more than 25, 30 human experiments in a year. Now we have five setups working on those uh, specimens. But the sort of the basic population sampled by our neurosurgeon is in the range of two to two and a half million. So in case uh, we consider Singapore and all of the, uh, the patients willing you know, to, uh, to donate 
uh, the tissue to be removed uh, for scientific purposes, chances are that uh, in this country, uh, the maximal output would be less than 100 experiments a year. And that's why I'm talking about, uh, you know, that we would really need a word effort uh, in this uh, sort of a direction in case we want to see further details of uh, uh, human networks. Now, a very simple explanation, possible explanation, which emerged in the last four years, uh, explaining the strength of our excitatory synapses, is hidden on this figure. Now, one explanation is that compared to the red average synaptic strength, in this case, we are showing that uh, with current recording, I mean, yeah, with current recordings, so that's why the excitation uh, is reversed uh, in, uh, in these uh, pictures. So the red amplitude is basically negligible compared to human uh, amplitudes here. So that's just only half of the story. The second half of the story is this here. So instead of a single sort of vesicle to be released in a rodent synapse, what we seem to have is multiple release in sub-millisecond time scale in a single synapse of the human output. Meaning that following a single action potential, what we do have is a sub-millisecond series of vesicles to be released, and so we do have uh, a multiplication of current going through synaptic membranes in the human postsynaptic neurons, as opposed to just a single synaptic vesicle being released and a single sort of uh, receptor action uh, taking place. And this I consider as a major uh, contribution to uh, our really, really strengthened synapses. So basically, with this mechanism, we can explain how come that we have monosynaptic EPSPs and possibly uh, uh, disynaptic inhibition uh, in our networks, because we have a strong connection from excitatory cells to inhibitory cells, which release the uh, neurotransmitter gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA. The second problem to be explained is that in case we have strengthened synapses from excitatory cells to inhibitory cells, but weak synapses from excitatory cells to excitatory cells, how come that you know, excitation still goes on? So we, we would you know, need some sort of strengthened synapses linking excitatory cells to excitatory cells further downstream. Now, there is a really sort of interesting explanation to that, and that is that, you know, picking up Janos Santagota's uh, work, who actually discovered a cell type uh, called exaxonic cell or chandelier cell in the cortex, we find that some of the GABAergic neurons might have excitatory functions on top of inhibitory functions, depending on the state of the network. Now, I try to give you some sort of an explanation uh, for that, uh, but uh, you would need, I think, uh, a bigger neuroscience background uh, for a proper understanding. So basically, the chandelier cells uh, look like uh, candles uh, actually stuck into uh, a chandelier. That was the original idea of Jean saint -Hagotay. And there is two really interesting features of these cells. These are the only neurons known to date targeting the exon initial segment of their postsynaptic neurons, right? The rest of uh, GABAergic neurons target different subcellular domains of postsynaptic cells like the soma, dendrites, dendritic spines. Second very important aspect of chandelier cells is that 
unlike the rest of GABAergic cell types, linking excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, these exaxonic or chandelier cells do not target other inhibitory cells. They only target excitatory neurons. Now, when we first compared the postsynaptic effect of a classical inhibitory cell, like a basket cell targeting uh, the perisomatic region of the target neurons with chandelier or exaxonic cells targeting the axon a couple of years ago, we found that these uh, green basket cells uh, basically produced uh, hypopolarization with a reversal potential of minus 73 millivolts. So please consider just hypopolarization for the moment, okay? However, when we recorded the effect of exaxonic cells on the axon of these cells, uh, it turns out that these exaxonic cells can have uh, no effect at all or depolarizing, meaning excitatory effect uh, on the target cells, as opposed to inhibitory effects of other GABAergic neurons releasing gamma aminobutyric acid. This was kind of surprising at the time, and uh, it took us uh, a couple of years to explain why is that. So these GABAergic synapses uh, use gamma aminobutyric acid and open up chloride channels on the postsynaptic cells. Now, depending on where you are on the postsynaptic neuron, uh, Right next to these chloride channels operated by GABA, you have or you do not have chloride transporters. In the soma, you do have these chloride transporters removing chloride from the inside of the cell. However, on the axon, these transporters do not exist, meaning that the chloride remains in the axon. This actually causes the shift in the reversal potential, meaning inhibitory to excitatory action in response to these cells. So GABAergic synapses targeting the soma cause hypopolarization. However, exaxonic synapses cause depolarization. Now, this is kind of crucial because this area of the cell, of the postsynaptic cell, the beginning of the axon decides whether the cell would fire or not. So we tested, basically, how easily a cell can be fired depending on where we activate it. So we made a little trick and, uh, you know, exchanged the internal solution of these cells to be able to compare the sort of the excitatory efficacy of these green inputs targeting the soma and these red inputs targeting the axon. And what we found is that when you measure the efficacy of these green inputs here, uh, then you need to depolarize the postsynaptic cell to around minus, you know, 48 millivolts. That's a significant depolarization applied through your uh, pipette here uh, in order to get the postsynaptic neuron firing. However, if you apply a GABAergic input to this part of the cell, you know, where the cell decides whether to fire or not, then you do not have to apply any depolarization, any excitation to the, to the cell through your pipette. A simple input from one of these neurons will drive your postsynaptic cell to fire. And that's a crucial difference between these two GABAergic cells. One of them is a true inhibitory cell. The other can be a very powerful excitatory cell, as well as a sort of a moderately effective inhibitory neuron. So let's just, you know, sum, sum up what a single exaxonic cell can do. It can inhibit these green sort of pyramidal cells. It can excite a couple of pyramidal neurons very effectively, and it can produce these downstream excitatory effects through the activation of feed-forward excitatory networks. I would like to emphasize that, you know, these processes have a very sort of uh, 
interesting ratio to them. You know, in most of the, most of the cases, these extraxonic cells are not connected to neighboring pyramidal neurons. More than half of neighboring pyramidal neurons do not receive inputs from these cells. 30% of the neighboring cells would receive slightly inhibitory or sli silent shunting inputs. So that's a weak output of these cells. And there is this 4% which would respond with a spike in response to a spike. Only 4%. And in 7% of uh, these downstream neurons, you have these polysynaptic events recorded like that. So basically, this mechanism makes human networks capable of producing this you know, downstream several tens of milliseconds uh, long events. So in case you sort of lost uh, the line of argument, let me just recapitulate uh, what you've heard so far. Basically, in case you activate a single human cell, you immediately are being regulated by this traffic light here. The traffic light is red if you look at it from other pyramidal, other excitatory cells, meaning only weak connections link excitatory neurons in the human cortex. However, if you look at it from GABAergic neurons, in most of the cases, the traffic light is green, meaning that you have a flow of information from here to this inhibitory pathway, this blue pathway, and you have spike-to-spike -spike coupling to this red pathway to the exaxonic cells, chandelier cells. Now, blue is for inhibition, red is for excitation, meaning that we need excitation for our propagation of downstream signals. So this is the signal pathway, all right? Now, why is this second traffic light here? Because exaxonic cells do not project back to excitatory cells, sorry, do not project back to uh, uh, inhibitory cells and do not project back to these cells here. All they do is they basically push the signal pathway towards downstream uh, pyramidal neurons. You do not have the traffic light here because these cells would inhibit basically everybody else. And that's very good for noise suppression. So basically, almost everyone Everyone's activity is suppressed, but the selected group of cells with activation of pyramidal neurons, uh, exoaxonic cells, pyramidal neurons, exoaxonic cells, and so forth. So you have this uh, increased signal-to-noise ratio in uh, the human uh, networks. Now, do we have some evidence for this? Uh, alternating excitation, uh, I mean, excitation, inhibition, excitation, inhibition. If you look at this uh, uh, human recording here, uh, what we did in this case, uh, instead of starting here, we started the event sequence here and activated a single exaxonic cell. And, and, you know, what we could observe here is like a minor uh, detonation, a minor avalanche of events surrounding this uh, uh, human cell. And this is the average of the response. So you have down, up, down, up, and down deflections, meaning that you have a sparkle of oscillatory activity in the uh, surrounding network in response to a single spike in a single cell. Now, if you look at the timing of these you know, oscillations here, and, uh, you know, dig into the literature, uh, the, uh, the length of a single cycle in this identified human network and this sharp wave, so-called sharp wave, recorded in the hippocampal system uh, of an animal, the length uh, of the cycle is exactly the same. Now, interestingly, sharp waves, uh, 
were put forward as a potential mechanism for memory consolidation in these animals. And we would like to speculate that this simultaneous noise suppression and signal pathways being activated in the human networks have something to do with not just memory consolidation, but also memory retrieval in this case, instantaneous memory retrieval. We do not have any evidence for that, but we are working on it with uh, large-scale uh, imaging uh, of human and also animal networks. And currently, we are capable of resolving in a range of three to 400 individual neurons uh, with high-speed three-dimensional multi-photon microscopy. Uh, and actually, last month, we just actually broke the uh, limitation of uh, resolving a single spike with uh, more than 90% reliability. So I predict that within half a year, we have an answer to this uh, question. Now, how to modulate these human networks? Well, <clears throat> chances are that 40% of the audience present here has already taken a group of pills called uh, SSRIs, uh, which is uh, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors in control of depression. These are the most widely prescribed drugs uh, for the central nervous system. However, uh, a couple of years ago when we started these experiments, I was kind of surprised to learn that there wasn't a single you know, human experiment prior to the appro approval of these drugs for uh, you know, human use. So we decided to have a look you know, what these drugs can do uh, with, uh, with our networks. Actually, one way of assessing how frequently these drugs are used uh, uh, was published in National Geographic uh, some time ago. And what these scientists did, actually, they just caught fish from rivers uh, around Chicago, and they just analyze uh, you know, what sort of drugs uh, are represented uh, in the fish uh, in those waters. And uh, guess what? Uh, I mean, this green portion, including these you know, uh, uh, yellow uh, fins on top, it's all antidepressants. Now, what do these antidepressants do with these feed-forward human networks when you take the first pill? This is the control situation. And this is fluoxetine, <laughs> alias Prozac, dosed uh, in the uh, pharmaceutical dose, basically. What you see already is like an 80% uh, suppression of these you know, feed-forward events. And if you supplement you know, 5-HT for these in vitro experiments, human slice experiments, to restore physiological concentrations, then there is a complete suppression of these events. Now, this tells you that basically uh, after the initial dose of Prozac, the human feed-forward networks are switched off. Now, you can trigger those uh, human networks with pyramidal neurons, and I don't think that I, can exp I should explain how different you know, these two plots are. This is with Pro Prozac, and this is without uh, Prozac. In case you activate these human networks from chandelier cells, this is the control event cloud. This is with Prozac, and this is after washing out Prozac. Quite some difference, isn't it? Now, just to give you some ideas, uh, basically we went after the actual receptor mechanism, uh, what sort of receptors uh, would be involved in what types of cells, and to run that up quickly, uh, we actually identified uh, serotonin 2A and 1A receptors being involved uh, in this process. And more than that, uh, we could actually pinpoint the actual you know, element of the network at which these receptors and Prozac 
would be active. So basically, what happens is that Prozac suppresses these very synapses here, which are crucial in initiating the sequence. And Prozac is incapable of modulating these other synapses. So based on this, what I would like to suggest is that uh, you know, a detailed analysis of human microcircuits would be essential in the better understanding of you know, how our most widely used drugs uh, can be improved or modified uh, to have an even more specific uh, effect. So how much time do I have? That's fine. 10 minutes is OK. Now, <clears throat> you've seen that Prozac actually suppresses these feedforward networks. Now, what about you know, strengthening them? in case uh, you want to have your students more clever you know, in retrieving information. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the literature, carbuckle is a very useful tool for the activation of these GABAergic neurons, not in the human, but in the rodent. So based on this principle, we tried and actually managed to activate these feedforward uh, human networks. So in case we applied bethanacol, which is a muscarinic uh, agonist, uh, we managed to sort of waken up uh, the human uh, network to quite some extent. So basically from zero to an active state, but uh, you can actually increase an already active state for further, uh, you know, liveliness with, uh, through uh, muscarinic modulation of events. I'm sorry, nicotinic mechanisms do not work here. <laughs> no, <laughs> we tried that too. So we tried uh, more than 30 uh, different uh, combinations of drugs, uh, but muscarinic activation was the most effective. <clears throat> so in the last 10 minutes, uh, let me just you know, give you a glimpse of what's possible in terms of uh, uh, molecular biology and new ideas emerging for a particular cell type in the human uh, neocortex. Now what you've seen so far is that you know, various various members uh, of our uh, neocortical cell types or various types of human neocortical cells are crucial in determining, in determining you know, signal propagation uh, in human networks. Uh, thus, we thought it would be handy to have some sort of a molecular handle on manipulating uh, these cells. Now, uh, we did only the first couple of steps towards that direction, but I think uh, we uh, sort of ended up uh, with a pretty surprising uh, result. Now, the particular cell type I want to sort of finish up with is uh, uh, the so-called uh, neurogliaform cell, which is a favorite cell type of mine. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was uh, revealed that cortical inhibition can be divided to two broad uh, sort of categories. One is the GABA-A receptor-mediated so-called fast inhibition, and the other is the so-called uh, slow inhibition mediated by GABA-B receptors. Uh, <clears throat> in the last decade or so, uh, we have found the actual cell type, the neurogliaform cell, producing uh, this slow inhibition, and we also recovered sort of the mechanism by which these cells uh, uh, act uh, in the neocortex. What they do is basically they mimic uh, the action of a Chinese noodle soup. Now, in a Chinese noodle soup, you have an extreme dosage of noodles and some soup, you know, between, the, you know, these, these noodles. These cells uh, do the same thing. So they form an extremely dense network of axons and the axonal network is so dense that the GABA, which is released from the axon, is accessible to everyone in the neighborhood. Whether that particular cell or subcellular compartment wants it or not. So basically, the entire uh, cortical area meshed by the, the axon of these neurogliaform cells 
discovered by Ramani Kahal, by the way, in the late 19th century, is actually bath in GABA. And that's what we call a unitary volume transmission. So single cell driven volume of GABA is accessible to everyone in the neighborhood. That's how these cells work. But we wanted to know how come that this cell type is so unique. And so we came up with a method capable of counting the number of RNA molecules produced by a particular gene in a single cell with the precision of plus minus one RNA molecule. The reason, I mean, the reason we did that is this method actually gives you access to RNA numbers in a particular condition, be it physiological or pathophysiological. So in case you collect cytoplasm from a pyramidal neuron or from a neuroglyphone cell, mix it with a special cocktail, dilute it to a fixed volume, and distribute that master mix onto a nanotube array having like 33 nanoliters each tube, chances are that you either have a single RNA molecule in a single nanotube, or you do not have that, a single, say, single molecule in a nanotube. Now this way, you can actually count the number of active tubes responding to a PCR reaction, identifying a particular type of RNA in that particular tube. So basically, you have a method which is capable of showing you basically how many of these RNAs are present in a particular cell, in a single cell. And you can be sure that you actually harvest a single cell because electrophysiology allows you to monitor the seal between your pipette and the membrane, and you can be sure that nothing is contaminating your sample. Now, how about the results? In case you search for insulin RNAs in human or rodent cells, in hyperglycemia, what you see in pyramidal neurons is around seven hits. When you lower the glucose concentration, those seven hits drop down to three hits. However, if you look at the number of insulin RNA molecules in a single neurogliaform cell, you end up having more than 30 in hyperglycemic conditions, and that drops down to around seven. Now, these concentrations actually uh, can be observed in diabetic patients or, to some extent, in physiological conditions. The point, is, point here is that we have a cell type the neurogliaform cell, which produces insulin, mRNAs, in copies, you know, responding to the external glucose concentration. Now, this is very surprising because, uh, you know, up to just a couple of years ago, uh, there were several schools completely denying the existence of local insulin release in the brain. And now we are suggesting that there is a cell type, a special cell type producing insulin, which is, you know, if you look at the literature, is not that surprising because insulin concentration in, in the brain is one or two orders of magnitude higher than in the plasma, than in the blood. So something is needed there to produce it. Now, of course, we were surprised by this result, and we you know, really nailed down uh, whether that this was due to an error. And uh, we actually sequenced uh, the uh, PCR product collected and produced from uh, a single cell, and uh, we actually managed to confirm the existence of uh, insulin uh, RNAs uh, basically uh, with 100% match to uh, 
the template. Now, <clears throat> we went even further and uh, contacted uh, a talented group of molecular biologists, uh, like 200 meters from our lab, and uh, wanted to know uh, the gene expression pattern of identified single neurons uh, in the rodent and also in the human brain. Uh, because, you see, having a readout of a single gene is very good, especially if it's such an important gene uh, like the insulin, uh, but, uh, you know, having a complete readout of, of gene expression would give you uh, a real perspective in case uh, you would be interested in manipulating that particular cell with molecular uh, methods. Uh, as you see, uh, we managed to uh, actually characterize uh, the gene expression pattern of individual neuroglioform cells, and just to show you how the insulin gene uh, is sort of recognized by uh, uh, our uh, 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 cheap reads, uh, it's obvious that in hyperglycemia, the insulin expression uh, is kind of different of uh, the uh, hypoglycemic uh, conditions. Now, in case you have uh, a gene chip uh, mirroring you know, high and low glucose concentrations, what you can do is search for metabolic pathways which would be highly or uh, not that uh, strongly affected by these uh, conditions. Now, <clears throat> when we actually rendered uh, the significance of these modulated pathways by hypo versus hyperglycemia, uh, the pathway with the highest significance to be modulated uh, was the diabetes mellitus type 1 uh, network. So out of the uh, uh, 18 genes, uh, basically 12 uh, of these genes were upregulated and two of those genes were downregulated. So there were barely a couple of genes which were not hit by uh, uh, these manipulations in the diabetes mellitus pathway. Now, this actually sort of boosted our confidence that, all right, we are in the right, right direction. So we wanted to see if insulin actually got released from uh, these cells. And uh, to round up the story, what you look for is, uh, is an effect of insulin externally added uh, to the system. And you want to mimic that, the effect of insulin, which is getting rid of these downward deflections uh, in our experimental conditions. Uh, by uh, actually uh, adding glucose specifically uh, to the cell you are interested in, in this case, a neurogliaform cell. And actually what we saw is in case we added glucose to a neurogliaform cell and measured these downward deflections in a neighboring cell, like this one, we could get rid of these downward deflection pretty effectively. Now this experiment actually shows you that in case you buff glucose to a neurogliaform cell, what happens is that insulin is being released and it suppresses uh, neighboring activity. And in case you block it with a new compound uh, available from Novo Nordisk, which is a specific antagonist uh, for uh, insulin receptors, you can get rid of that effect. Now, this is a classic way of uh, actually showing uh, that uh, there is an, uh, uh, a neurotransmitter active uh, in an identified network. So basically, just to uh, uh, sum up, I think uh, today I wanted to convince you that uh, in vitro observation and manipulation of human networks is possible at the single cell level. There are specific aspects of you know, human networks, in particular feed-forward networks, in case you compare them to animal networks. And now we have the tools to analyze those networks in detail, and detail meaning down to the precision of single RNA molecules expressed by identified cells in those networks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gabor. Thank you so much.
uh, we started five minutes later, so we have basically time until 11.45, six more minutes. So if there are some questions, please come up, Prabhu, and then we'll wait. Okay. So my question is, how did you make sure that the samples from the human subjects were really healthy? So this is the first question, because around tumors, you can find infection information and vascular changes. And the second one is, did you test it IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, in those humans? Uh, to the second question, yes, we did. Did you find it? <laughs> no. So the, uh, uh, <clears throat> so it's, it seems to be specific to the insulin pathway and not the IGF-1. Uh, first question is uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, so, when you, uh, so when you have a sample, there is a standard neuropathological examination going on for each of the, uh, uh, the patients. Now obviously, uh, the volume of, of, the, of the samples we are using, uh, just to give you an idea, it's basically, but usually it's a less than five by five millimeters of cortical surface, you know, taken out uh, by four uh, scalpel cuts. And then through that hole, the surgeons actually access the deep brain tumors. Deep brain tumors mean that we have a minimum of one centimeter distance between the identifiable borders of the tumor and the deep layers of the cortex. And that's what we call you know, safety distance. Now, infiltration uh, is proven in less than 10% of our samples by neuropathology. Uh, we are usually talking about uh, gliomas here. So that's 80% of our cases are gliomas. On the other hand, we also have cases uh, with um, uh, aneurysms, uh, and on those cases, infiltration can be excluded. And yet, uh, the phenomena uh, actually I was uh, uh, referring to today are the same. So this is a further proof that uh, what we are seeing is not, the bio, is not a byproduct of uh, uh, you know, metastatic processes. But you mean ruptured aneurysm? No, 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 no. It's, you know, it's not ruptured aneurysm. It's preventing the rupture of an identified uh, aneurysm. So but then how you can take the samples from the brain if it's just a prevention? Well, you still have to access it, right? So. <laughs> Okay, well, fascinating research indeed. My question is of a rather general and rather informative nature, I would say. Um, I was just wondering while listening to your talk, uh, just informatively, have you done the same experiments comparing, because looking at your title, what makes us human at the level of neocortical microcircuits, right? From your talk, I could understand what makes us non-rodents. But have you done the same thing with respect to uh, chimpanzees, monkeys, and have seen things, things there? Well, you know, of course. The, yeah. yeah, so uh, monkey experiments were done, uh, but these feed-forward networks uh, were not seen. However, uh, it's a lot harder to get access to monkey material these days than to human material. Uh, and let me just, you know, uh, put this question back. So why would you be interested in monkey in case you would have access to human? So, uh, but, you know, just uh, <laughs> so, uh, but I think uh, uh, your point is completely valid. Uh, you know, not seeing something doesn't prove anything. So, uh, uh, but seeing something does. And we saw something which we felt uh, important and relevant to, uh, you know, at least why uh, human signal processing can be more advanced uh, than others. Thank you. <laughs> to see uh, if there are uh, critical differences between the human cortex and, uh, let's say, rodent cortex or uh, monkey. Um, I am trying to relate what you observe with the anatomy of the brain. And um, it is uh, known that the arborization of the pyramidal cells uh, 
in um, the cerebral cortex change dramatically from the prefrontal cortex to the visual cortex. That's right. And um, the first question I have is whether uh, you did some of these experiments with non-prefrontal cortex, because most of the samples are from the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, and for the prior, uh, prior. Of course, you anticipate to have this, maybe because of the global neural networks, with whatever <laughs> you like of the other reasons. And do you find the same thing? in the posterior uh, or not? Posterior, I'm not quite sure because, you know, uh, most of our samples are from prefrontal and parietal. So... Um, are they parietal or prefrontal? Yeah, yeah parietal. these are the two. These are the two areas. And do you find difference talking, between no, prefrontal no, and no, parietal? No no. no. no, from this respect, no. Not at all. Uh, I would be curious, actually, uh, about the uh, long-range inputs to these particular uh, chandelier cells versus yes. other interneurons versus pyramidal cells. Mm -hmm. Because what we suspect, this is just a suspicion, is that the, uh, these strengthened outputs uh, might belong to a, a subclass of pyramidal cells, but we are not quite sure yet, uh, since all we have access to is the local axonal arborization of pyramidal neurons and not to the long range connections due to you know, slice preparations. Uh, let's hope that the, uh, uh, that the imaging methods uh, uh, will develop to a single cell level in the next decade or so, and then we can uh, really, uh, you know, look into that. Um, my second question, so you are working on slice? Yeah, so what we because do... Because you did not mention at the beginning, how did you uh, yeah, so study the, your you take, sample? Yeah, but so basically what you do is you uh, take this plug out of the cortex, what the yes. surgeon has to remove, and then immediately, you know, I usually stand next to the surgeon mm -hmm. with my uh, uh, ice-cold uh, artificial yes. cerebrospinal fluid and do the slicing right away. It's a slice. It's a slice, yes. Yeah, because the second question was about uh, uh, nicotine versus uh, <laughs> miscreen. Because miscreen, yeah. Uh, we did a lot of studies with the prefrontal cortex of rats very long time ago, and uh, uh, we did find a, a very uh, strong response to, to nicotine. In the pre so um, uh, I was wondering whether uh, uh, there is any effect of the slicing, or, or and you or remove the, uh, uh, you know, the, the nicotine receptor are supposed to be presynaptic in most of the case. Yes. And you look mostly at the postsynaptic response. Yeah. yeah, but actually, what we what we study is uh, uh, so looking at the paired pass ratios, uh, one can determine whether the effect is pre or postsynaptic. Yeah, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the effect of 5-HT is uh, definitely presynaptic. We are not quite sure uh, whether uh, the uh, sort of cholinergic influence on interneurons is pre or postsynaptic, most likely that it's postsynaptic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, it seems that the uh, uh, nicotinic uh, aspects, I mean, the nicotinic modulation is stronger between pyramidal neurons, I mean, pyramid to pyramid connections, compared to pyramid to interneuron connections. So there might be a specific, uh, you know, uh, pre uh, even along the same axon, it could be that uh, several uh, uh, cholinergic receptors are, are differentially recruited depending on whom that particular synapse is facing. Mm -hmm. Last thing, very quickly. Um, your uh, synapses that uh, you showed are not on spines, otherwise uh, you would yeah. not have uh, such a long... Yeah, in the interneurons, in the, uh, at least in the human cerebral cortex, you have interneuron types with and without uh, dendritic spines. Yeah. The, the, the types, we find these extremely uh, it's strong... A, it's uh, not synapses. a single spine because... Uh, no, it's, 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 on the, it's on the dendritic shaft. Very, very long, long uh, some kind yeah, so of these, synapse. These synapses it's a special are, synapse. And how frequent are these? Because how frequent? Uh, how uh, usually people mean think that in the the cerebral cortex the synapses are on spines mostly. Yeah, but uh, you know, so let me put it this way: if you study uh, synapses between excitatory cells, pyramidal cells to pyramidal cells, yes, 
90 plus percent of synapses are on spines. However, if you look at synapses from excitatory cells to GABAergic neurons, it's a complete opposite. So you do have a couple of intraneuron types with spines, and those receive excitatory synapses on the spines. However, uh, these intraneurons, uh, basket cells, axonic cells, and several others, do not really have spines on their dendrites. So the only chance uh, is dendritic shafts uh, for these synapses. And uh, uh, however, it seems to be a huge dynamic range in those synapses. And uh, in fact, we started uh, to collaborate uh, with uh, Zoltan Nusser in counting the actual number of receptors uh, within a single synapse linking human pyramidal cells and intraneurons. And uh, it seems that a subpopulation of synapses is, uh, we cannot actually count the number of gold particles labeling uh, the, the receptors postsynaptically because we have a huge number of receptors there compared to other synapses. So it seems that there is an incorporation of amporeceptors, selective incorporation of amporeceptors to a subset of synapses on these uh, inhibitory neurons. Not, not to this strength. Paul, last question, and then we have to go for the next speech. Right. Um, my I want to remove or move the conversation to yeah. the notion of engagement when, when learners are engaged. And then I want to reference uh, Jean-Pierre, if I may, the 15-year-old, the, uh, the, the maximum synaptic activities at 15 years old. So uh, I don't know whether I can get this right, but I'm going to try. So engagement continues to support the exit excitatory or excitatory impulse, correct? And then we find that it downstream it supports this pyramidal, um, uh, I guess, linking of uh, dendrites to create the neural networks that will, will, will consolidate what we know as memory. So uh, help, me, help me a little bit with that. What I really want to know is, if we can, uh, if we know what it is, that sustains that engagement, uh, and we can target uh, that process to the maximum synaptic activities to 15-year-olds, can we then uh, begin to look at benchmarks for what is required memory and what we might be able to do to uh, enhance the uh, support of that benchmark memory with the use of computers to uh, support uh, aggregation of uh, memory, or not so much aggregation of memory, but access to information that can be used by that stored memory to uh, extend the learning experience. All right. Sort of that's how okay, I'm so kind of trying to okay. <clears throat> a little bit. Well, let's have this wild uh, imagination of uh, being able to manipulate thousands or millions of cells with single cell precision with a computer architecture. I mean, single cell precision. Because, you know, the way I see it is that uh, a really simple explanation of, you know, memory consolidation and retrieval is that you have a subset of strong connections, and those strong connections will be the ones which last following the puberty, okay? That's a very simple, you know, way of putting it. Now, the key element here is to find those networks downstream of uh, really important cells or really important initiator networks, I would say, uh, which will be needed later in life and which are redundant. Now, if you, you are in a position, then you can identify those initiator networks with, I mean, a precision of a few cells or even less than that, uh, then you are in a position to strengthen 
those networks which can be activated from that particular cell. But you need that sort of a precision for that. Technically, it's not feasible at the mo as far as I know at the moment. Uh, but if there would be a way to do so, and I'm, you know, you, we can think of like, uh, you know, nano amplifiers uh, directed genetically to a particular type of cell or a subset of cells. In theory, you can do that if you have, you know, a small enough uh, amplifier which would actually be incorporated into uh, the cell membrane and would regulate, you know, the action potential uh, initiation. Uh, so I can think of ways of how to do that. But, you know, technically it's, it's not there yet. Uh, so in case you would have this nano amplifier technology directed to single cells at a certain age, um, and you can actually modulate the activity of those amplifiers from outside at your will, then I think we would be in position to, to tackle the question or tackle the problem you were suggesting. Uh, I'm more interested in not so much uh, targeting it that way, but really focusing on what is it that we need to do with respect to a normal uh, development pattern with students or with children and, and learners that, will that, that can help us understand what that engagement is and then marry that without having to you know, find a benchmark and marry it with our approach to the use of computers so that what we don't do, as Jean-Pierre said, is change something dramatically in the brain that's not going to have a very positive and productive impact on our society. Actually, what I'm suggesting is not a dramatic change. It's, uh, it's really it's just access to implement the particular change, changes you want to. Because you know, my major problem with current techniques is that we ignore ignore cell type specificity and connection specificity to an enormous degree. And actually, as Jean-Pierre you know, pointed it out, it does matter who is connected to whom and at what age. And, uh, and I would like to stress that point again. Thanks very much. Apologies. I think we have to close now this session.